Now you will see it'll show up right there. You can go ahead and start the Yelp preview. And I'll paste it in. You can start talking, Michael, because you're live on YouTube. Don't we want to have Don't we want to have that translucent? Yep. One up. So my audio should not be going out right now. Hey guys, Michael Hyatt here. Welcome to the pre-show. We're going to start the weekly show here in about nine minutes. But in the meantime, we're just going to have a little banter, let people get a chance to get on the show and get connected and dialed in here. If you're watching this show in a replay, you can scrub ahead using the fast forward, go to the end of the timer, and that's where the show's going to officially begin. But I'm glad you're here. I'm thrilled. Last week, we had a few technical problems. And this week, I've brought in the ace engineer, the audio guru of all times, the video live streaming guru of all time, David Foster. And he's switching tonight. And so he assures me this is going to be flawless. Now, he can't vouch for my content. I mean, that is what it is. But in terms of the technical part of it, I think we've got it under control tonight. So thanks for joining us. And I've got one question that I want to ask you as you're getting on, and you can just comment for us on Facebook or YouTube or Periscope or wherever you're watching from, and we'll feed those comments into me. But on a scale of one to five, okay, how does your organization do on executing new initiatives? In other words, you know, maybe you go off and you do strategic planning and you come back and you're all excited about all this new stuff that you want to implement in your business or in your nonprofit or whatever kind of organization that you run or participate in. What how does your organization do in executing against those new plans? On a scale of one to five, one being we're terrible at it, and five being we kill it. We're execution ninjas. So on a scale of one to ten, five, excuse me, how does your organization do on executing new initiatives? And I'm going to go see what comments we've got coming in here. So let me flip over to these. This may take a minute for him to come in. And my team, if you're on, you can feed these into Google Keep. I'm not seeing any right here, but I bet there are some. I just can't refresh the screen. Ah, Ian Weber says three out of five room for improvement. Greg says he's a three also on Periscope. Yeah, you know, I think in my own organization, just let me put this in here too. We've got increasingly better at it. You know, we haven't always been great at it, but um, we read a book a little over a year ago called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And my guest tonight is Chris McChesney, who's one of the co-authors of that book. 
that book had a radical impact on how we execute. And I would have to put us at probably a 4.5 right now. I think we're doing so, so much better. So um, Michael Gurley says a 3.5. Cindy Mosley says I'm just uh, starting, so zero. Yeah. Uh, Caleb on Facebook says executing strategic initiatives, our team is a four. Fantastic. We have a couple of things we're working on to move it to a five by the end of 2017. Ready to learn tonight. Joel Collins says five. That is incredible. New startup, so we're quick. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've, I've realized is that it's easier when you have fewer people. You know, I've run a company that had like 650 employees and now my company has 20 employees and it's a way different thing when you're running at a larger scale, obviously. Brian Taylor says 40X is amazing. Fantastic. So again, the question is on a scale of one to five, how does your organization do on executing new initiatives? Are you good? Are you great? Or do you still have some room for improvement? So let us hear in the comments. We are looking right now to Periscope, to YouTube, and also to Facebook for those comments. I don't know how your weather is where you're at, but um, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee tonight. And we had crazy weather last week in the 70s. And then all of a sudden, over the weekend, it got crazy cold. So we had snow on Saturday, and I told people it was coming. You know, I thought spring is just getting a little bit too pushy, elbowing its way into the seasons, and not giving winter enough time to show off. And boy, we got snow on Saturday. It all melted pretty quickly, which it typically does uh, where we live in Tennessee. But it's still cold. In fact, it's going to be down to 21 uh, tomorrow night. Okay, a few more comments. Ian says, getting the team aligned and ready for new initiatives is key. Agile approach works well. Yeah, I've been on the boards of some software companies who use the Agile system for uh, executing, and that's pretty amazing. And that, by the way, was from Periscope. Somebody on Periscope was making that comment. Ian was making that. All right. Any other comments? How many of you have read? I'd love to know this. How many of you have read the book, the Four Disciplines of Execution, co-authored by my guest tonight, Chris McChesney. Four Disciplines of Execution. If you've read that, let us know in the comments. Always takes a minute for these to get fed in because my team is scanning for them and then copying them into Google Keep so that I can see all of them, one of them in a steady stream. Yeah, here comes one from Periscope. Michael Gurley, he says he read it a few months ago. Facebook, Joe Ziz says, I've read it. Kathy uh, Corridan says, love, love, love it. Jonathan Milligan, yes, read it. Great read. Hey, Jonathan, good to see you here tonight. Awesome. I'm going to just check the time. We've got about a minute till showtime. Jonathan Smith says he bought it and is in, it's in the reading hopper. Jonathan, I hope after you uh, hear Chris tonight, it'll go from the reading hopper to actually reading it because it's an amazing book. I think it'll be a real game changer for your organization. Matt Jones says, yes, and this is from Periscope. He's reading it a second time. Yes, great book. I'm reading it a second time. Fantastic. Another comment coming in from Facebook. Amy Caswell says, adding to my list to read. Yeah, we'll give you a link in a little bit. Or, of course, you can buy it from your favorite retailer. I'm just double checking the time as we're going on here. We're just about 30 seconds out or so. Kathy says, heard the audiobook years ago and have followed it for years. Yeah, so I listened to it first on audiobook, and this is what I always do. So I listen to it on audiobook, and if the book is really good, if it captivates me on audio, then I immediately buy either the hardcover or the Kindle book, and then I reread it so that I can take notes. And this is one of those books that I actually bought in three formats. So I got the audiobook, the hardback, and then I got the Kindle so that I could do a search on it. Uh, Ganesh says, 40X is a great book, loved reading it and applying it. Here's a Periscope comment. 
Oh, hoping this will be recorded. Didn't plan ahead of time for this. Absolutely, this is gonna be recorded. The great thing about Facebook Live and YouTube and Periscope and all those, it's live. I mean, I'm live right now, but it's gonna kick over to the recorded format immediately when we finish. Usually it takes a couple of minutes, but then you'll be able to get it. Okay, we are ready to start, guys. All right, in three, two, one. Do you remember the last major initiative that you watched die in your organization? Did it go down with a crash or was it slowly and quietly suffocated by other priorities? By the, finally t the time it finally disappeared, it's likely no one even noticed. What happened? Well, according to my guest, number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author Chris McChesney, the whirlwind, you know what that is, of urgent activity required to keep things running day to day ate up all the time and energy that you needed to invest in executing your strategy for tomorrow. Does that sound familiar? I'll bet it does. Well, I've invited Chris here to share with us a simple, repeatable, and proven formula for executing on your most important strategic priorities in the midst of the whirl whirlwind. Hello, I'm Michael Hyatt. Welcome to my live show where each week, We'll talk with a different thought leader about some aspect of personal development, productivity, or leadership. And my goal is to help you win at work, succeed at life, and lead with confidence. Let's get started. I first met Chris McChesney last fall when I hosted him at my Productivity Summit, and we instantly hit it off. I knew we would connect again in the future, and in case you don't know him, Chris is the co-author of The Four Disciplines of Execution, Achieving Your Wildly Important Goals, also known as 40X. This is a book that's had a huge impact on my own company. Chris is the global practice leader of execution for Franklin Covey, where he has worked for more than two decades. Welcome, Chris. Good to see you, man. So glad to be here. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'm really excited about our topic tonight. Your book is about execution. So let's just start at the very beginning. How do you define execution? Sir, is uh, implementing strategy, uh, but that gets a little vague for people. I, I think the best way to think about it is the work that you do in addition to maintaining your operation, the work that you do to move the organization forward. And that, I think, very quickly dials you into exactly what kind of work we're talking about when we talk about execution. Yeah, and so often it seems that organizations can be really good at planning, really good at strategic planning, and then the execution, they get back into the office and back into the day-to-day -day and servicing the whirlwind, and that's kind of when all it all falls apart, doesn't it? Yeah. The, this, the best way, I think, to think about this and, and everyone can do this. Everybody that's here that's implementing or executing anything, I think you can relate to this. There's a rub between urgency and importance. When execution stumbles, it's because, it's because of this, this clash between those things that we know are important, mm. uh, but we seem to default always to those things that are more immediate. And that, that's, where, that's where we see the majority of the frustration. You know, Simon Sinek says, start with why. So I want to raise this question. Why does execution matter? I mean, in the big scheme of things, why does it matter? Yeah. Someone the other day in, in one of our comments and, and chat sessions made the statement that, you know, a, an idea is useless without execution. Hmm. And every leader has felt that. There's this horrible regret from thinking about, you know, what, what if, right? What, what if we were able to pull that off? What would have happened? That's a horrible place to go. Uh, and, and really it comes down to execution. We think it's the, we think it's the number one leadership challenge. Specifically well, why, executing when, when it requires a change in people's behavior. You know, I know that you speak in tons of companies and we'll get into that a little bit later. Some of the companies that you've spoken at and taken them through the 40X process. But in, in your experience, do most companies or most organizations struggle with execution? And if so, why? Why are most organizations not so good at it? If that in fact is the case. Yeah, I think there's a whole bunch of reasons. And, and even as we go into the disciplines, each, 
it's interesting. Each discipline has sort of a poison pill. Each discipline has a reason <laughs> that it's a little bit counterintuitive. We we might you know like the idea intellectually, but emotionally we tend to really struggle with it. So I think mm. all of the first of all, all the basic principles are a little counterintuitive. But if I had to give you one really big reason, we have a really hard time saying no to good ideas, and wow. the inability to narrow the focus really takes um, a lot of leaders out of the execution game very early. You know, I've heard that uh, that was one of the things that Steve Jobs did so well. And I can't remember if this is quoted in the book or not, but I remember him saying that he was as proud of the things they said no to as the same things they said yes to. Can you elaborate on that? Do you know that story? Yeah. Um, it was interesting. When, when we came across this, there's actually a quote uh, by Tim Cook where he describes Apple as the most focused company in the history of the world, according to them, which is really <laughs> ironic because we think of Apple as this bastion of innovation, but they don't. They thought of themselves as the most focused company in the world. And, and you might think that saying no to a good idea would be you know, the enemy of innovation, but they said that their whole key was putting an enormous amount of energy against the fewest number of initiatives. And when we read that, we were already six years into this process and we felt like, okay, that is such wonderful validation. They're, they're looking at the same natural law that we are. Well, I'll tell you, one of, one of the things, one of the things I realized when I read uh, the Four Disciplines of Execution is that in my organization, we were trying too much new stuff. You know, we were just swamped. And especially when you're in the whirlwind, and I'd, I'd love for you to explain that concept of the whirlwind a little bit to us. Well, it's it's a little bit interesting. We we actually missed this. At one point, we had 12 root cause reasons execution breaks down. And the truth is none of them were root cause at all. They were all symptomatic of the whirlwind, right? We, we were, you know, lack of clarity, uh, lack of buy-in, poor accountability, uh, poor cross-functional collaboration. We're not hiring the right people. We're not training the right people. We, we, we had, we had 12, like I said, 12 root cause reasons execution breaks down and we started to understand that all of these things were symptomatic hmm. of this rub or clash on one side between the enormous amount of energy required to maintain the operation right what we call the whirlwind right. and the energy to you know to move the organization forward and if you ask people in the moment we always tend to default to the whirlwind and that gets back to that clash between urgency and importance yeah, because like you have to keep the business running. You have to keep the organization moving forward. You've got a lot of stuff you've got to do that's just the uh, business as usual. And then to take on something new. I mean, where are you going to get the time? Where are you going to get the energy? Where are you going to get the resources? But that seems like it's the essence of execution is trying to figure that out and narrowing your focus. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, you know, you're touching on something that I think a lot of people um, feel. You know, wh wh where is this going to come from? The first thing we would say is, Please don't think that the whirlwind is bad. It's life support. That's what's keeping right. you alive. And, and we'll go a step further and say that it's okay to give the whirlwind 80% of your energy or your organization's energy, but don't let it take 100%. Okay, that, because, and it will if, if you let it, but you're gonna need that other 20% on that other, on, on executing against that critical objective. Boy, that's so good. Well, I wanna talk, a little bit personal, but um, just for you that are watching this, Chris and his wife Constance make their home in Cummings, Georgia. He has, get this, five daughters and two sons. And as many of you guys know, I also have five daughters, which may explain why Chris and I hit it off so well. But in addition to his work at Franklin Covey, Chris has a passion for boating, water sports, and coaching. But Chris, I know that you started at Franklin Covey in PR, is that right? Yeah, uh, Seven Habits had just come out and I was helping Stephen Covey uh, book interviews like this, which is kind of weird and a little ironic right now. Just parenthetically, I wasn't going to ask this, but I got to ask this. What was it like to work with him? I mean, he's a hero of mine. I was a groupie, right? I was the same. Really? I worked there. I worked there for four months before they realized they weren't paying me. I had invented an internship <laughs> that didn't exist. It was like an episode of Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> Only they fired Kramer when they found out he didn't actually work there. They kept me. But I, I and, and you know, I didn't even expect to see the guy, but they would send me into his office with the questions that he was going to be asked and different things. 
And, you know, just just an amazing, uh, interesting individual, uh, very, very spontaneous and just as authentic and, and an, uh, an incredible sense of humor that you never saw on stage. Really? So, yeah, he, he had, like you, a tremendous impact on my career. Wow. My life. Well, such an amazing guy. Well, how did you go from PR to getting personally interested in execution as a discipline? Well, the, the PR thing really was only just a stepping stone to get into the organization. Okay. I, I had a love, I had a love for this material. And for about the first 10 years, I managed sales organizations and all the frustration that comes along with that kind of work. Um, you know, there's that moment. I think a lot of leaders experience this where they've been effective individually and it's their first time to really get in a leadership role. And it's like, sometimes it can be like a punch in the stomach when you realize mm. that your talents and your abilities don't really matter very much. If these people aren't gonna get behind you, if they're not gonna support you, you're only as good as they are. Yep. And so much, there was so much frustration around that, that as we started to develop this execution methodology, I, I immediately felt connected to it. And, and that was probably 2001. 2002. And uh, I haven't done really anything else since that's been sort of my myopic focus. Wow. Do you think there's a relationship between execution as an individual, your ability to execute on your own objectives, and your ability to lead a team to execution? Yeah, I, I it goes back to Dr. Covey's work about private mm. victory before public victory. And I, I think one of maybe one of the other reasons that I gravitated to this was because I wasn't very good individually. I had a lot of energy, but in, mm. in many ways, I was my personality was almost the opposite of these four disciplines. And it's funny because one of my, our other authors, Jim Hewling, he's the embodiment, right, of this stuff. He lives this stuff. He's like a walking poster for the four disciplines. And I'm like the antithesis of it. The, the Dallas Morning News did an article and they were quite pleased with themselves. The, the headline of the article said, Ritalin kid helps organizations focus. And, uh, and actually, that was actually true. I was, I was on Ritalin as a kid for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So for me, you know, mm. what was there ever sort of an in inciting event in your own life that led to your ability to really execute? I mean, I don't know, crisis in your career or moment of truth or something where you said, man, I have got to get my act together and start executing. You know, for me, it was, it was the realization of these principles with other teams. Like I had to see it happen mm. with other people first. And when we started doing this, there was a and the book is dedicated to a gentleman named Jim Stewart who passed away eight years ago. And Jim had the original construct. And Jim and I worked very closely together. And when we pilot this and we'd see these breakthroughs, um, that, that really changed me. And I think I had to, I had to see it and um, I had to watch the application of the principle to, to really become converted. I, I think that was the catalyst for me. Well, it's so true, isn't it? There's so many times that we see things that other people um, more easily than we see it in our own lives. And it, and it comes into graphic relief when we can see it demonstrated or illustrated uh, by somebody else. So I, I want to turn to some leadership application here. And, and Chris has led several well-known corporations through the 40X process, corporations that you would know like Marriott and Ritz-Carlton, Kroger, Home Depot, Coca-Cola, Lockheed Martin, Frito-Lay, He's one of Franklin Covey's most in-demand speakers worldwide. And Chris, I wanna get into the nitty gritty of the four disciplines of execution. But before we do so, can you explain the difference between a wildly important goal, we've already talked about the whirlwind, but what's a wildly important goal as distinct from the activity that we engage in just inside the whirlwind? I, I love that you're asking that question. That I think is the jump off point. Hmm. And I'm gonna ask this question to everyone that's listening. And okay. we'll, we'll do it through an example. In your own life, in your own operation, think about what lives, what objective lives at the intersection of really important, this, this has to happen. And if I'm honest with myself, it isn't gonna happen. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're not gonna get this done. And, and it's, that, it's those two ideas. 
there, there's, there's a critical gap that has to happen. And I'm fully aware that our existing momentum, our existing inertia is not going to make it happen. It's at that intersection where we always find the wildly important goal. And that is always distinct from the sort of life support whirlwind that's necessary to maintain it. You know, I've noticed inside of organizations too, when they're, we're talking about wildly important goals, it's really easy for cynicism to set in because of what you were just explaining. And to think, you know, this is really important, but given our culture and given the whirlwind, it's probably not going to even, it's not going to happen, so I'm not even going to try. Do you find that is something you have to overcome when you're teaching 40X to organizations? This has been, this has been one of the most interesting and surprising parts of the whole thing has been dealing with sort of natural cynicism and the way that takes hold hmm. in an organization. Um, Cynicism is always present, particularly if an organization has a track record of, of you know, failed implementations yep. or if the whirlwind has killed a number of things. You've got all the you've got all the cynicism that's necessary. Um, but but what we find is that that people will gravitate to something that feels like a winnable game. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the mechanics in the discipline that start to show viability. And, you know, and as we talk about this, as you break a goal down in discipline one, as you identify the leverage points in discipline two, and particularly as they start to play a role in what the plan is. I think if you just force the disciplines on a team, you're going to get cynicism. If they help create the solution, you start to see light at the end of the tunnel. I and love so that. that that dynamic around cynicism, um, when you do it right, you know, we have a lot of luck, but if you just, if this is just something you push on a culture, then yeah, you have to be prepared for cynicism. Okay. Well, let's break into the four disciplines because this is where the rubber meets the road. And honestly, this is where I started getting excited reading the book and listening to the audio, audio was I realized this is doable. These guys have broken this down to a formula. So discipline number one is all about setting a target. Can you explain the process of setting a target to us? Yeah, so very simple um, terms, and, and go back to that, right? Go back to that intersection, right? Really okay. important, isn't gonna happen on its own. And then answer three questions, right? What's the starting line? Where are we now? What's the finish line? Where do we have to be? And by when, what's the deadline? The little nomenclature we use is from X to Y by when. And that has a way of locking in an idea. And let me tell you why, because it sounds basic. But let me tell you why this is important. So often goals masquerade as concepts. You'll hear a leader mm. talk about a goal and they'll describe it and they'll, they'll use a lot of words and they'll try and make it inspiring. And by the time they're done, you're not 100% sure what it really is. Bottom line <laughs> is it's hard to execute on a concept. you got to translate concept into target, starting line, finish line, deadline. And that's for the team. That's for an individual team. Now, if you're an organizational leader, I want to give you one more wrinkle. If you're an organizational leader, you have multiple teams that may have to right, all bring right, their, their game in order to achieve a high level objective. Here's the, here's the idea that we would like you to think about. We want you to still do that from X to Y by when statement for, for what the organization has to achieve. And then answer a second question. What are the fewest battles necessary to win the war? I think some of the most meaningful work we do with organizations is to deconstruct a high level objective into the fewest number of executable targets at the front line of the organization. So every team has one thing that they're driving towards that high level goal. So it's really, again, about the focus and focusing your attention, focusing your resources, and not having it spread over a bunch of stuff you're trying to do, but getting it down to one or two that you're really uh, focused on at any one time. Is it's almost right? like there's a currency. There's, there's this energy currency. And the reality is we only have so much of this energy. And if, if you take that currency and you start spreading that currency out, it's not enough to get through the whirlwind. And you can't, um, you can't believe how you have to wrestle with people to get them to narrow their focus. It's like everything inside of you wants to fight that yep. idea of narrowing the focus. We're not wired for this, I promise you. 
No, we're not. And I teach a goal setting course called Five Days to Your Best Year Ever. And we've learned a lot from 40X and we've incorporated a lot into that program as a result. But we get people that always think they're the exception. You know, look, I know you're advocating that we focus on one or two goals a quarter and not more than that. But, you know, I can understand that for everybody else. But I'm taking on 13 for this quarter. And every time, those are the people that wash out. They complete nothing because it's just too much to focus on. Do you find that same kind of thing? It's exactly why we call it a discipline. There, and we love this term, right, this idea that there are always more good ideas than there is capacity to execute. Love that. And it's like you either accept the principle, right? Because if you, you, can, you can ignore the principle, but the principle will never ignore you. <laughs> Perfect. Can you give us, I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you give us some examples from Discipline One of targets that are set well? Yeah, okay. So um, you've got a, a division of Comcast that wants to reduce the amount of time their internal systems go down. So they're going to go from, from 29,000, what they called impact minutes, to 12,000 impact minutes by the end of the year. Uh -huh. Okay, and that had started as a very loose concept around all the various things they could do to support the organization. And after really working it down, it got to a very specific point. Or we want to reduce um, in transportation, we want to reduce uh, driver turnover from 106% to 86% by the end of the year. And that those are sort of like the big wigs. Those are the war statements. And then you get to these more tactical battles that say, okay, we're gonna, you know, one of the battles for reducing driver turnover is we're gonna get their trucks out of the shop quicker. We're gonna reduce mm. that from 24 hours to, to, to 20 hours. Or one of the other key battles is um, we're gonna keep our um, at home commitments. When we promise a driver they're gonna be at home, they had no idea what their number, right? No numbers even were, right? We, we, we learned we only keep our promise 82% of the time. We're going to move from keeping our promise 82% of the time to 95% of the time. Those fewest key X to Y by when statements that roll up to a bigger objective. So until, these could be on a personal. I'm sorry, oh, go please, ahead. Yes. Well, I was just going to say, until your team or entity has about 80% control over that objective, that's how you know you've sort of gotten the water to the, to the end of the rail. So this works in your personal life too, right? Like you could say, I want to reduce my weight from 200 pounds to 185 by, you know, December the 31st. So that would be the same kind of thing applied at a, at a personal level that you're applying at an organizational level. As a matter of fact, and this is almost a little embarrassing, look at people who've achieved, you can reverse engineer these disciplines right out of people that have achieved massive goals. Like look at anyone you know that's lost 50 pounds, right? Three right. out of the four disciplines are there every single time, right? They weren't trying to do six things, right? They had their life and they're trying to lose weight, right? So you saw discipline one was there and they had a target, right? I'm promising you it wasn't a whim. There was a target, right? And they didn't just know the concept of diet and exercise. They were tracking the data. That's the big yeah, thing with good. discipline too, right? And they, they're, they're, right, they, they had a way to visualize it and they were probably accountable to someone. I'm gonna tell you, you look at anybody that's really done something magnificent, you can reverse engineer this stuff right out of it. We did not invent the principles. Principles have always been there. We just really spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to apply them. That's awesome. Okay, let's move on to discipline number two. That identifies activities that provide the greatest leverage to achieving our WIGs. And could you explain the difference between, key concept, lag measures and lead measures and how you'd use them in the pursuit of better execution. Okay, well, let's stay with the same example we just had because that's the one that everybody uses, everybody gets. So if weight loss, right, if weight loss was my wildly important goal, then going from, you know, 195 pounds to 185 pounds, that might be my lag measure. The weight is the lag measure. That's how I keep score. Lag measures measure the goal. The lead measure, that's the thing we're going to do to move. That's like the lever we're going to do use to get at the lag. And the lead measures would be diet and exercise, but not just the concept of diet and exercise. You got to know the numbers, right? Everybody knows diet yep. and exercise. What everybody doesn't know, how many calories have I eaten today? How many calories have I burned, right? That's the crux of it. 
So those would be the lead measures that if you pay attention to, you'll eventually get the lag measure in line with what you set in the target. Is that a fair representation? Yep, that's it exactly. Think of it this way. I love the analogy of a lever, yep. right? It's like diet and exercise are the lever that move this rock, which is weight loss. And maybe that rock's always been too heavy for you to move, right? This, I love right. this. But that's why we use leverage. Leverage with a lever, you can move a very heavy object, but the rule really applies. And in leverage, you have to move the lever a long ways to move the rock a little ways. So you have to move, you gotta really, you can't be, you can't be cutting calories by a hundred calories a day and think you're gonna move anything, right? You right. can't be running a half mile. You gotta really, you gotta hit that lever if you wanna see that rock move. But the key to me was when I was reading about discipline too, like my head exploded. Cause I thought I've been focusing on the lag measures and too often you get to the end of a campaign or you get to the end of an initiative and you missed it. But it's too late because the lag measure is measured what's happened and whatever was going to happen has already happened. Whereas lead measures get you sort of forward focused where you're, you're, you're doing the things that are going to determine your future as opposed just to measure your past. The great quality guru, Edwards Deming, he wasn't using the term lag and lead measures, but he was talking about them. And he described, he was talking about a set of financial metrics. And he said, if you're running your operation based on financial metrics, it's the same as driving your car by looking out the rear view mirror. You're making Perfect. decisions based on what's already happened. And that's exactly, you, you're even using that language. You were saying looking forward versus right looking behind. But here's the thing, we're all hardwired to go after the lags because yep. the lag's more important. You know, I don't even like diet and exercise. I want the weight loss. And this is the, this is the awful one. Lag data is easier to track than lead data. Mm. I can give you a hundred examples, right? It's the, the, your kid's report card will come find you. That's lag data, right? But, but knowing how many hours Sarah spent studying this week, knowing what Sarah's current homework average is, that's lead data. You got to go get lead data. And you, so what that means is you got to really want that wildly important goal or you will not go get that lead data. Yeah, that's really good. So one of the key things that leaders need to do in their organization as it comes to discipline number two is to really identify those lead measures that are going to determine whether or not they hit that target, but realizing it's going to take some work to try to ferret that out. And I know in the, the book, and maybe you could just briefly overview this, what are some of the characteristics of good lead measures? The best way that we've found to think about this is focusing on two words, predictive and influenceable right? Mm. Predictive means if I move the lever, right, it's going to move the rock, right? I, that's the part of lead measures. Everybody sort of gets the cause and effect part, right? It's going to lead to the lag. But then the other part is influenceable. If I can't move the lever, you know, any more easily than I can push the rock, that's not a good lever either. But every time you get, if you can get both predictive and influenceable, right, you know, you're at a leverage point. But, but we also have a warning with this. Don't go crazy with the lead measure idea, right? Mm. We, we tell people this is, four disciplines are a treatment you use against a very finite, very specific, very focused target. That's why we like one wig per team. You try and load a single team up on track and lead measures against five different targets, it won't last two weeks. Wow, that's a good word. So really discipline yourself to limit the number of lead measures so that you don't overwhelm yourself or overwhelm your team. Okay, discipline three, I, I hate to move on because I can talk about this no, stuff no, all night. No, no, let's keep going. Let's keep I'm going. geeking out on it. But uh, discipline number three is about creating visible scorecards that show how team members are performing. Why is that important? And more importantly, how do you do it? Yeah, it's important because we're talking about the kind of execution that requires human engagement. Hmm. And what we've done in discipline one and two is we took a concept, a strategic idea, and we translated that into a lag measure and a lead measure, right? So you've right. gotten it from this bubble to this lag and this lead measure. In discipline three, we're gonna turn it into something. We're gonna turn it into a live game. A target is not very motivated just to hear or listen to a target, but when you see it actually go live, when you see the cause and effect relationships, I'm gonna say it like this, when you can see that you're either winning or losing, 
that seems to have an immediate effect on people's behavior. And, you know, it, it, it says that this matters if we're tracking it. So it, it, it's, the, it's the natural byproduct of the work that you've already started. You know, there's a lot of talk today among leaders about, you know, gamifying systems. Is this kind of like that or how is it different? Probably the biggest surprise to us was how powerful this was. We'll mm. get questions all the time about what are the incentives that you're using? How are you paying people for this? And we're embarrassed. We don't have good answers. We're like, we never even got to that. I mean, you know, I don't know, spiff them if they, if they hit it. Um, it's almost comical, but here's the point. It doesn't happen immediately. It's not like you put the game in place. And we started using the word game you know, really a few years before gamification as a term really started to get momentum, mm. we stumbled on this thing. And what we started realizing is, is that if you can get two things to happen, if you can, if you can put the game in motion and let the team get a little bit of traction around lead measures they picked, yes. right? That in, the, in their mind, that says, okay, this is a winnable game. They don't have to hit the objective. They just got to see the rock start to move from pushing the lever. And that cues the idea that this is a winnable game. And the second mm. piece, the game's got to matter. Mm. If you're, and, and, and by the way, that, that has less to do with how you sell it up front and the rationale that you use to tell people why this is so important and make the t-shirts and have the banners. It's less about... <laughs> It's less about how you launch it, and it's more about how you play the game. Uh. If you've got discipline, and if you keep your eyes on it, and if it matters to you, they get that this thing matters. And, and again, there's another intersection right there. Winnable game, high stakes game. And that's, yep. where we saw, that's where we saw all the spike in engagement. Well, and that naturally leads into Discipline 4, which basically is designed to instill accountability through weekly meetings called WIG sessions. We do the, these at our company every Friday. But why is that important? And what does a weekly WIG session look like? All right, perfect. Okay, so the best way to think about this, Disciplines 1, 2, and 3 set up a winnable game. Discipline 4 is how you play the game. If you don't do Discipline 4, setting up the game doesn't do you a bit of good. Right, hmm. all the action, all is everything is in discipline four, and discipline four. And Michael, you you comment on this too because you're doing you're doing these. But in discipline four, what you're doing is carving out a very small chunk of time. You're going to go very fast, and each person's going to make just a couple of commitments to what they're yep. going to do to move the lever. Right, that you've heard the term force against leverage. Discipline four is all about force against leverage. All right, you know, this week, what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? I've got to make five of the bigger, large cart parts because you know we're making too many trips to the front line, or I've got to meet with Martin because his numbers have been off the last two weeks, or I got to give you something this week that's gonna move the lead measure. And here's what we know about those commitments. There's sometimes that those commitments are ingenious and innovative, and sometimes they're very basic. They are never urgent. These are the activities yeah. that typically get annihilated by the whirlwind because you've always got 50 things that feel more urgent than acting on strategy. But that meeting makes those kind of activities urgent because because if you and I, Michael, were in a wig session, I'd have to report to the team next week whether I did the stuff I said I was going to do. And that seems to close the cycle. Well, it kind of harnesses the power of peer pressure in a positive way, too. I mean, you're keeping the visibility of that particular wig elevated and those lead measures focused and everybody has an accountability for their commitments and nobody wants to let down the team. But also those commitments don't seem like they're a big deal. The whole target is a big deal, but the commitments in any week, you really don't have any excuse if you don't accomplish them because they're incremental to hitting the target. At least that's how we've experienced it. Well, it's exactly what we've seen. Um, the commitment, particularly if the commitment comes from the person, if the leader gets in the bad habit of dictating the commitments, you lose that mojo you're describing right there. But the yeah. way we describe it is that, that, you know, people don't like to disappoint their bosses, but they get over it. But they really, they really don't like to disappoint their peers. So true. 
Well, look, do you, um, do you have a few minutes for us to take questions from our audience? Love to. Yeah, okay, great. I'm just going to go over to the computer here. We've got a bunch of them. Uh, Suzanne Kelly said on Facebook, really enjoying tonight's show. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Mark said, great value add with this broadcast, Michael. Uh, Facebook also, Dave uh, Gabriel said, what are the fewest battles necessary to win the war? He's just uh, quoting you on this one, Chris. Brilliant. Uh, Facebook also, Andy Traub said, why is it hard? That's why we call it a discipline. Classic. Again, they're quoting you. Uh, Ian Weber said on Periscope, awesome content, really useful. Thank you. Hope we're getting some questions here. Uh, Facebook also, Jonathan Milligan said, lag data is easier to track than lead data. So true. And Dave Gabriel said, and this is again on Facebook, when the team helps build the dashboard, it's super powerful. Now, I just want to just take a minute and come back to that one. How, how do you involve the team in doing that? Because I think as a leader, one of the faults that I have is, and maybe this is all leaders, I don't know, but you think, okay, I got the right answer. And I'll just tell the team what the right answer is. And that's not usually the best approach. So as a leader, how do you help the team create the, first of all, identify the lead measures and then create the scoreboard? We went, that's a wonderful question, Michael. We went around on this for so long. And let me tell you where we've landed. We love the idea of hypothesis testing for a bunch of reasons. So if you're the leader, we would say, yeah, think through what the lag measure is or, or should be and think through all the possible leads that might work with it and then just sort of give it to the team. Let them have at it, right? Give them, first of all, give them a chance to convince you that maybe you're aiming at the wrong, wildly important goal, but recognize you're the leader and the onus is on them to convince you, okay? But then with lead measures, really take hands off. Give them a menu. Edwards Deming taught that people within 12 feet of the work understand cause and effect relationships the best. And so mm. what we've found is if you just ask them for the lead measures, most people blank out. But if you give them your thinking and then let them sort of look at the list and go, oh, I see what you're after. Well, your number two choice is pretty good. But here's another one you didn't think of, boss. And, and it's, it's, this, it's this dance between giving them your best thinking That's and then letting them come with theirs seems to be by far the best technique we've found for doing that. Now, do you usually let them uh, work independently when they're coming up with that so you're not in the room and they're just working among themselves and coming up with the lead measures and the scoreboard? You probably could, but, but we don't. We, 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 we keep the leader facilitating this whole process. As a matter okay. of fact, one of the things we learned was that as consultants, we shouldn't do that work for the leader. Originally, we would sort of work around the consultant with the team, and then we realized it was much more effective to let for us to work with the leader and then let the leader work with the team so that that leader felt ownership at the same time. And then it really becomes a leadership skill um, to, to, you know, to, to give the best ideas, but allow the group to think and allow the group to own. And, and, you know, it's a little bit of a dance, but I, I think the best concept there is hypothesis testing. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I know we've had a few other questions come in. So let me just grab a few of these. In fact, uh, several Facebook question, Prince uh, Valiant Tangelo ask, what is lead data? We did discuss that earlier, but for those that missed it, just can you briefly summarize that, Chris? Yeah, so the lead measures are anything that you can influence, they're influenceable, and they're, they're predictive of the outcome you want, right? They're influenceable, they're predictive. So what we say is the lead measure is only relevant in its ability to lead to the lag measure. So you always start with the lag measure, the outcome, the goal, whatever it is you want, and then back up and say, okay, what could we influence that would have the biggest impact on that. And then the analogy everybody gets is diet and exercise lead to weight loss. That's good. In fact, there was another question about weight loss. Let me just see if I can find it here. Um, Chad Tucker from Fa on Facebook said, can you elaborate on disciplines three and four using the weight loss example? Yeah. Okay. So um, the discipline three, so we'll take it the next step. Discipline three, keep a compelling scoreboard. Here's the idea. People play differently when they are keeping score. Doesn't say people play differently when the boss keeps score for me. 
And so what you, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna lose weight, where's that visible, I would even say public accountability. And I wanna see the lag measure, I wanna see the, the weight, and I wanna see whatever you're doing for the lead measures, whatever those calorie burn or calorie consumption goals are. And I wanna see both, and I wanna be able to look at both of them and see, or am I, am I ahead of schedule or am I behind schedule on both of them? Am I winning or losing? Hmm. And that makes the whole thing, there's something about the scoreboarding. People talk about writing down a goal. A scoreboard, and it's not real until you write it down. But let me tell you, if writing it down makes it real, a scoreboard makes it breathe, right? Then it becomes very real. Discipline yeah. four, and, and here's one we've learned. Don't do discipline four by yourself. Don't have an accountability meeting with yourself, okay? You gotta have a partner. You find out somebody else who's losing weight, or you find, or join Weight Watchers, shoot. They almost got the whole thing mapped out. They've got it wired. <laughs> I know it, right? It's the best weight loss program in the world. The full thing is practically four disciplines, right? But they do, they, this is, they got lead measures. They got accountability yep. sessions. Like the day we saw that, we thought, I wonder if they'll sue us. But I swear we weren't looking at them when we came up with the principles. But that was what I'd say. Have an accountability partner and go back and, and, and report every week on what you're doing to get those leads down. Fantastic. We got time for one more question. And it's this one. Uh, Joshua Little asked on Periscope, he said, any advice on how to pick battles? What does that process look like? We, we love a good story. When John F. Kennedy wanted to go to the moon, right? That was the war. That was the big objective, right? The goal had been this loose thing about, you know, uh, lead the world in space exploration because we were competing with the Soviets, right? And then Kennedy said, man on the moon by the end of the decade. And he created that, you know, X to Y by when statement. Here were the battles. This is actually where we got the idea from. There were three battles, navigation, propulsion, and life support. And the NASA engineers knew hmm. that if they could crack the code on navigation, right? Earth, moon's not standing still. If they could get to 25,000 miles an hour, and if they could keep astronauts alive in deep space, they could do the impossible. And there's something about that story that leadership teams love and they sort of will relate it to themselves and say, all right, what's our man on the moon statement? And what's navigation, propulsion and life support? And a lot of times from a process standpoint, you might, you might have 15, 20 battles, candidate battles, and then, but you have to remember what are the fewest, if we just hit these three or these four, or maybe it's only two, could we really win the war? And, and there's something about that process that starts linking objectives closer to the front line, because then you have the teams link into those battles, but it also starts to, to validate feasibility. You start mm. to realize, you know what? If we could win those three things, you know, we could win the war. And, and that starts to eat away at the cynicism and, and people start to believe a little bit. But, that, but here's how I would say it. Discipline one, organizationally, can you translate concept into the fewest number of executable targets? That's the big idea. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, this has been super. I'm excited all about 40X all over again. But before we go, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with our audience about execution? Um, yeah, if you're gonna go down this road, keep the idea in mind about um, creating a winnable game. One of the things we've learned is that if you ask someone, what was the best moment in your career? Like go to that time when you couldn't wait to get out of bed in the morning. Every time they will describe a time when they thought they were winning. It's one of the very best things you can do for someone. Doesn't mean you have to be winning at everything, but somewhere within your operation, can you find and help create a winnable game? Not only does it get results, um, I think it's one of the most valuable things you can do for your team is, is give them that satisfaction. Outstanding. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. And thank you guys for joining us. If you haven't already done so, let me encourage you to grab a copy of Chris's book, The Four Disciplines of Execution. You can get a copy on Amazon at michaelhyatt.com slash 40x. There's a URL on the screen. And yeah, that's an affiliate link, but it'll take you directly to the page. But I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Michael Hyatt Show, and I look forward to talking with you next week, same time, same place, 
I'll be interviewing another thought leader about uh, some aspect of leadership and what we can do to really change things. So guys, again, thanks for joining us. I'll see you next week.